This is Mae Bressel. This is tape number 346, August the 18th, 1978. Side one. Make mention last week on the tape about the death of Pope Paul VI. Uh, he passed away on Sunday, August the 6th. 1978. I suppose the reason I didn't mention his death at that time was that I wanted to cool down a little. I get very angry at these glowing obituaries and uh, the portrayal of him in the news as a great liberal or being almost too liberal. And uh, they described the Pope as being the most traveled of all the Popes. But what the obituaries never say, or they never say when he's alive, is that this I think is the only pope, at least that's been exposed, as being in the OSS, which is the forerunner of the CIA. And I don't want any Catholic people to be antagonized, but they might read Bruce Roberts' gemstone files to read about the drug traffic in Southeast Asia and allegations of the pope being familiar with many of the people uh, that were behind the Vietnamese War and also in the narcotics traffic. Also, it's too bad that he didn't live long enough to uh, uh, face a book that it was supposed to come out in June of 1977. Now, that's a year ago. The book might be suppressed. But there's a book that was supposed to come out in England called Treason for My Daily Bread. Uh, as I say, it's a year uh, now that we learned about the book by Mikhail Lebedev. I mentioned him, Lebedev, and... Uh, he was a Russian Nazi agent who helped Martin Bormann escape from Germany when he was sent down to South America after uh, Hitler's regime collapsed. And <clears throat> according to much of the printed literature, and I think it's even been confirmed by uh, a lot of people who have studied the Nazi exodus from Europe, that it was this pope who helped Martin Bormann specifically to leave uh, Germany and into Italy and then travel to South America, and many of the very top Nazis um, took that route from Italy to Spain and then South America. This book that is coming out um, goes into the fact that the Nazis and Martin Bormann were behind the killing of John Kennedy, that they had a large part in the killing of John Kennedy, and a description of the book said their route, in case old intelligence hands are interested, was from Flensburg, Sally, to Brunswick, to Ireland, Erlen Dragons, I'll write this out for you so you have the route, in Austria, and then they were disguised as monks. The two men were disguised as monks, and Martin Bormann uh, went out as a monk, and they hid in an Italian monastery until November 1945, and then Bormann went on out of the country, down to Paraguay, and it suggests that Nazis were behind the Kennedy assassination had a role in it. And, of course, this has been one of my allegations for a long time. Mr. Lebedev, uh, according to this book review, it was in The Guardian, uh, said a right-wing conspiracy existed to assassinate President Kennedy and that an English gun had been used, a hired gun, and when John Kennedy was murdered. And, of course, Oswald was the decoy, the dupe, and that it was actually a .45 bullet that killed John Kennedy, and, and that these agents had been set up by Martin Bormann. And, of course, uh, it was the Pope who helped uh, Martin Bormann escape. So uh, I, did, I don't take much credence to these long obituaries that I read in the newspaper, but I like to read as much of history as I can while a person is living, not to defame them when they're dead, but just keep track of what they were doing while they were alive. I have two apologies here, and then we'll get right into the SLA story. One is that my tape cassette is not fixed yet, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, with this one, it isn't the best quality, and neither is the other one. It's, the equipment isn't as good as being at KLRB, and maybe I'll have to go back there and tape the shows if, it, if the machines break down here. But bear with me, and uh, you'll get the message. And the other is if you hear a panting around on these tapes and uh, coughing, I have a 12-year-old Cocker Spaniel who has a heart murmur, and he doesn't leave my side, and I don't mind really, except when I'm making the tapes. And he's right under my feet wherever I go, and he seems to want attention, and he isn't feeling too well. So he's panting and puffing, and if I put him in another room, he just scratches the doors and cries. So except for these times, just bear with me, because if you hear something in the background that's 
honey in his old age, and I think he's asking for some attention, undivided attention, which he doesn't get. So that's not me. That's honey right here at my feet. It's something I have to live with, I suppose. Talk about Patty Hearst because her name's in the news right now a lot. It has been right along, but the trial's coming up of Emily and William Harris being charged with Patty's kidnapping, and it's only been four years since she was kidnapped, 1974. This has been a long wait to try Emily William Harris, and of course, I wrote in my article in 1974, Why Was Patricia Hearst Kidnapped?, that I was told by Alex Bodist of the Drug Enforcement Agency, that, and when he worked in Indiana, that Angela Atwood and her husband, Gary Atwood, and uh, William and Emily Harris were agents, narcotic agents, on the campus in Bloomington, Indiana, before they came out to infiltrate the prison system and work for the FBI counterintelligence program. And when you're in prison and you're locked up, uh, the word goes out if you testify against another person in prison, you're a snitch. And that could be the trigger to kill Patty and thereby letting the Harrises out. And it's very important to know that not only is she in a prison in Pleasant, California, where she has to testify against the Harrises while she is in prison, but that Sandra Good and Squeaky Fromm were placed in the same prison. Now, you have a bomb here, a potential bomb from another area besides her being a snitch. Is that Sandra Good and Squeaky Fromm are linked to the intelligence community, and Charles Manson still directs these women. Manson was put into security last week um, or two weeks ago, in Vacaville because he had some kind of a temper tantrum that he couldn't contact Squeaky and Sandra. And all he has to do, Charlie, is to give the orders, you know, to kill her. And they will. These Nazi types take orders. They're brain controlled. And the another danger here, a bombshell, is that Squeaky Fromm was down the federal prison in San Diego, federal prisons because she threatened to kill the President of the United States, of course, Gerald Ford, um, and then she was sent to, back east to Virginia to another prison with Sarah Jane Moore, who worked for Randolph Hearst during the People in Need program, who admittedly was an FBI agent during that whole period. And it, uh, Sarah Jane Moore, who was charged with attempt to kill President Ford, also uh, took responsibility for the death of Popeye Jackson, the head of the United Prisoners Union. And there's a whole can of worms of FBI, IRS, DEA agents that can still serve in order to get out of prison or be given leniency. They can do a crime. I've gotten letters from men and met them who were offered a chance to escape from Soledad if they would kill somebody on the outside or kill somebody on the inside. And a lot of my awareness on the prison systems comes from being on the radio for seven years and uh, KLRB and the tapes in other cities reached uh, to Folsom and Soledad, Tracy and Vacaville. And that's where I got a lot of information on the prison systems and Donald DeFries and Colston Westbrook and so forth when I first wrote my article in 1974. Now, those of you who don't have my article, the SLA is the CIA, can write to me. I still have a few copies left, and then I hope someday that I can get it into a book with the follow-up since I wrote the article, uh, making my allegations on one section and then following it up with what happened four or six years later, the questions that were never answered. And uh, I've been rereading this article. I sent several copies to the Hearst family. I've been doing it for four years and never got an answer. And finally, Reverend Dunkey, uh, Patty's priest, called me, and I have been in touch with him telephonically in the last three weeks, and I will be seeing Patty in September. Hopefully, uh, they're arranging a meeting. And there was a woman in prison that said to her, you should meet uh, this woman in Carmel, uh, May Brussel, and she told Reverend Dunkey, and he told her that he was in touch with me. And I think we can help Patty, but the big thing is to keep her alive. You see, there's techniques when you get into the prison, and I will give you some of the suggestions I gave for her and gave to him, and in the event that she is killed, we'll have these as a record uh, to watch the trial. Before I do that, just before I do that, I just want to read the introduction with you one more time for those of you who have or don't have my article, the SLA is the CIA, because I wrote this, as I say, in the summer of 74. It was four years ago. And I made this statement that the kidnapping of Patricia Hearst was vital to the creation of the SLA Army, which, of course, I transcribe as CIA. 
It was as important as the murder of our Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was to the beginning of World War I. Both the kidnapping, her kidnapping, and his murder were used as an excuse to declare war. The ensuing battles had been carefully prepared and anticipated by the merchants of death, meaning the armaments, manufacturers, the police, the FBI, uh, the army, everybody that was to gain from this signal. The end goals of the SLA are World War III, that is the CIA, to plunge, plunge the third world masses into starvation and slavery. We have accomplished this through the CIA in 77 countries. The third world inside the United States is the next selected victim, meaning the Chicanos, the blacks, the um, women's movement, even the leftist organizations, all radical organizations. And uh, by infiltrating them and sending up, uh, identifying their leaders at the time of the People in Need program and so forth, uh, they were easily identifiable and who was working for them and I even suggested that food could be put into the uh, uh, baskets that had poison in it, such as dildren in the chickens that were handed out in that $2 million food program. And I've read recently that there's a high incidence of cancer in blacks in the uh, Northern Bay area, which I think is interesting, and we have to watch that years from now and see how those statistics come out. The purpose also was to discredit the people at Berkeley. The radical movements were discredited, and then they could be associated with kidnapping and terror and murder and bank robberies and so forth. And the, I suggested very strongly in this article that this operation of the SLA was a continuation of what we got a glimpse of at the time of the Watergate affair two years later that is still being exposed, of um, how the CIA and the FBI and the Pentagon work and rig elections and uh, affect our lives including the district attorneys, the Justice Department, the attorney generals on down. These uh, operations, the uh, SLA and the kidnapping operations that would escalate after Patty and from the time that Patty was kidnapped were part of the FBI counterintelligence program and the CIA uh, Tom Charles Houston plan combined with the Pentagon and, as I say, infiltrating all the way down to the local police levels to create the police SWAT teams that are used and will be used uh, during food riots and unemployment. There are unemployment riots stirring up now down in New Orleans where large amounts of Vietnamese have been brought in and where you have an 80 percent unemployment of black youth, something like that, um, and no houses, no low-cost homes, no jobs. And the Vietnamese are getting the choice positions in the uh, uh, town that are, is mostly a tourist town. So you see it in this area at the airports, at airport stores, at restaurants, uh, with the baggage and all over where blacks used to be employed, the Vietnamese have been moved in. And then this is going to create a volatile situation. The Vietnamese were part of the CIA Phoenix program in Southeast Asia. And so they're coming in to move out the Chicanos and the blacks, which will provide a natural restlessness with uh, no homes and no jobs and no money for food, and the SWAT teams will be ready. And this is an important thing to watch because I believe it's not coincidentally happening, but was planned in long stages over a long period of time. Well, I got a letter from the committee in uh, San Mateo to help Patty. July 19th, one of the women had heard me on KGO, and I wrote back and said, well, of course, I will try to help release of Patty Hearst, and they sent me literature from Westchester, Westchester, Illinois, and I'll give you these addresses and give you a copy of the petition and close so that you can write letters. But the favors that I would want from Jimmy Carter are more than just clemency for Patty Hearst. This should actually be a full-scale investigation of the entire SLA affair, even the creation of the double of Donald DeFries, that book, The Black Abductor, that I'll go into more if we have time the decapitation and the cutting off of fingerprints of Donald the Freeze when the body was sent to Ohio, the lies about the autopsy reports and where the bodies were and about their identification, uh, uh, the documents found on the floor of the house when it was burned down, the travel of the SLA members to Europe and the possible links of them to international, the CIA abroad and meeting there to make their plans for actions that took care here. I think that this is a scandalous affair that's gone on for four years, and here is Patty with her life in danger sitting in that uh, 
jail to testify against the Harrises. Not only will I help them, but I pulled out of my files a registered letter. It was certified September the 4th, 1975, and sent to Randolph first, in which I sent my third copy of The Realist, I guess. They never acknowledged that I was alive up to that point. And this was just three weeks prior to Patty's uh, being uh, brought in or so-called arrested in San Francisco area. And I wrote to him, and uh, also on radio programs, I had said that Patty Hearst will be brought home within three weeks, that the CIA, FBI will have to stop the charade for several reasons. And one of the two reasons, the main reasons, was that Wayne Lewis, an agent who had infiltrated uh, the SLA for the FBI and was an agent of the FBI, surfaced publicly and had press conferences identical to the way Lewis Tackwood broke the story of Watergate and wrote a book, The Glass House Tapes. And Wayne Lewis came out the end of August in 1975 and alleged that Patrick Gray's nephew, Donald Gray, was the man who killed Donald DeFries and the others at close range behind the house at the time of the shootout. Now, Patrick Gray is a man who's just been indicted by the Justice Department uh, for his FBI COINTEL operations in the East, he was the acting director. He hadn't been confirmed at the time that Watergate came. He was put in in May after J. Edgar Hoover died. And I believe the next day or so, uh, Wallace, George Wallace was shot. Watergate came in June, and uh, I accused him of covering up various murders in California and riots, counterintelligence out here of uh, Ruben Salazar's murder and Jerry Lee Almay's murder and the riots at Isla Vista. Patrick Gray was instrumental in covering those up and covering up the ITT expose in the Justice Department. He was in the Justice Department when these took place. So I knew he couldn't investigate the Watergate. And then Wayne Lewis came out with the allegations that, um, and this was after I'd written my article. I wrote the article in 74 saying that Nancy Ling Perry and uh, Angela, De, uh, Angela and um, uh, Donald DeFries had been shot at close range, that they were not, uh, uh, Angela Atwood was, were shot purposely. They weren't left to flee the house. They couldn't flee. They had to be killed. They were agents. And um, I said that the bullets hit them at close range. And a year after I wrote that article, in 1975, Wayne Lewis identified the man who, he said, did the shooting from the back of the house while all the photographs were at the front where the firing took place of that house down in Los Angeles where six were murdered. And he said the man who actually did the close-up shooting was Donald Gray, the nephew of Patrick Gray. And right now he's a teacher at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Now this is terribly important. If a professor of the FBI, training the FBI from all over the United States, is the man who shot these people from the back of the uh, house, without allowing them to have a trial or to speak for what they were doing. This is a very serious charge. And Wayne Lewis said that the FBI had contacted him uh, two weeks before Donald DeFreeze died and said that they were going to kill Donald DeFreeze and that uh, uh, he was to take his place as the new leader of the SLA. And uh, when he talked about this replacement, it reminded me that in 1974, in April, I had an article that I wrote with Stephanie Caruana, who was at the house here. We gave it to Rolling Stones, and we said it has to be printed right away. The article I wrote was, is, Lee Har is uh, Donald DeFries the first black Lee Harvey Oswald, saying that he worked with the police, the FBI, and the CIA, and that they would kill him, set him up as the patsy or the leader, and kill him. And the Rolling Stones said they couldn't promise to get it out within a few months. They didn't see any urgency. So we took it to the Berkeley Barb, and uh, luckily they printed it. And three weeks before the shootout in Los Angeles, where all six were killed, uh, my article was printed. It's a large four-page article. And I have some copies here, but just three or four, so I can't send them out. And they're full sheets. They're hard to duplicate. I'll have to get it reprinted and get you the article. Is Donald DeFries the first black Lee Harvey Oswald? Because I had those out and was saying that they were getting ready to kill him. And then a year later in 1975, Wayne Lewis, working for the FBI, said that, uh, oh, I guess this was a week after my article was out, he had been hired to replace Donald DeFries as the new leader of the SLA, which, of course, he didn't do. And he surfaced and told how that the FBI was in constant contact with them all the time and knew where they were. Another reason I knew Patricia Hearst would be turned in at that time was that J.J. J. Arms, that famous 
investigator from Texas, had an article in the time, it was in Time magazine, and he said that he had been offered 500000 by a large magazine chain to find Patricia Hearst, and he said in quotes, I'm waiting for clearance from my attorneys to make sure I won't be obstructing justice. Arm said, if I get the green light, I'll find her in two or three weeks or less. I don't mess around. So as soon as I read that, I knew that uh, Patty Hearst would be in within three weeks because if it was a CIA operation, uh, no private magazine, I don't know who it was, whether it was National Enquirer or who it was that was putting up this money for arms to find her, but he he knew where she was and he would know where to get her. And if all of these uh, people, Emily William Harris and Patty, were in the hands of private people, then the control of Patty couldn't continue and the trial wouldn't have gone the way it did because as soon as she was arrested, she was put in a cell and the cell was bugged and that was used in the trial against her. And um, the framing of Patty Hearst, the continuous framing of Patty Hearst, wouldn't have continued, and uh, uh, it would be important for J.J. Arms to keep his hands off of her, and therefore they had to bring her in. And after I made those allegations and um, on the air on, I think, WBA in New York and some different radio stations, um, Patty was brought in, and when she was brought in, Charlie Bates of the FBI, uh, who was trained in England in counterintelligence, he was in Chicago in the FBI in charge of the uh, Fred Hampton Mark Clark, uh, murder down there of the Black Panthers, he went to Washington to be in charge of the uh, investigation of Watergate. But he had to be moved in the San Francisco area by 1972, even though Watergate was pretty well covered up by Charlie Bates, because it took two years to plan the creation of the SLA by the Tom Charles Houston plan, the COINTEL operation, and Bates had to be firmly entrenched into the Bay Area. James McCord wrote in his book, A Piece of Tape, that uh, several days after the arrest at Watergate, about four days after the arrest at Watergate, John Dean asked L. Patrick Gray, the acting director of the FBI, who was in charge of investigating the Watergate investigation. And Charlie, uh, the answer of Patrick Gray was Charlie Bates, of course. And I had that on the cover of my article. He said the same, F I said the same FBI official who was in charge of kidnapping Patty Hearst. Patty had a, an interview, a long article that was done in series in some papers and as a whole in others by Bob Green um, about her feelings about being in jail at the present time. Uh, she's asking for a new trial. She doesn't, didn't like F. Lee Bailey. But, of course, uh, the reasons they're asking for it are really the wrong reasons as far as I can see. She says, in quotes, uh, F. Lee Bailey was ineffective. But the truth is, when I wrote the SLA as a CIA, I really meant it was a CIA. And if and when it is, you only get a CIA lawyer to handle the information. And Bailey uh, was very effective in keeping out any possibility of investigating any avenue that I was asking in my articles. And I wasn't even paid uh, a half a million or whatever the Hearst paid him to defend Patty. I was asking, as an individual woman in Carmel Valley, what in the heck is going on around here? Uh, when you have a CIA operation, you don't get a good defense. Percy Foreman didn't defend James Earl Ray. He told him to plead guilty. Um, Grant Cooper didn't f defend Sirhan Sirhan. He told the jury uh, his client was guilty. Uh, Mark Lane didn't represent Lee Harvey Oswald. He went to the Warren Commission and wanted to represent the deceased Oswald. But if you read the testimony that he gave before the Warren Commission, it was the most mealy mouth, ineffective. Uh, ridiculous uh, suggestion that he would even be able to take the position for Lee Harvey Oswald at that time. And F. Lee Bailey uh, didn't protect Patty Hearst. He was the man that James McCord called first to be his lawyer, and then McCord went over to Bernard Fensterwald, also of the CIA. Uh, Leon Jaworski, a CIA lawyer from the Anderson Foundation and the lawyers' organizations, uh, was at Nuremberg. He didn't do a good investigation there. He was on the Warren Commission in a cell with Jack Ruby, representing the state of Texas. He didn't do a very good job there. He went to Watergate and investigated that and didn't get into the Howard Hughes money or Bibi Rebozo or the money that went to Hubert Humphrey or Richard Nixon, the million dollars that was transferred to all of these people, Lyndon Johnson or the Mary Jo Kopechny story that was part of Watergate of the shooting of George Wallace. And then Leon Jaworski went on to the CIA Korea story, and he leaves, in quotes, dejected, as if the whole 
prosecution of this case, the true story, hinges on one Korean testifying, and therefore he goes home and says, well, I quit. CIA lawyers are ineffective because if the operation is CIA, that is their role. And actually, they are geniuses with um, PR jobs to represent them to be very effective in covering up what they're doing and always coming out looking like they're on top. I think they're geniuses at it. She said that he went to Las Vegas uh, at night and he was drinking a lot and he was shaking and tired. It wasn't the fact that he spilled a glass of water down his legs that made him ineffective or that he took pills to sober up that made him effective, ineffective. It was that he went to Las Vegas, the town where all these conspiracies and assassinations have a large piece of the action and the funding from the skimming money and uh, also Robert Mayhew's headquarters were in Vegas when he was working with agents uh, of organized crime and so forth that were involved in these various assassinations and bringing in these uh, sli lawyers for these operations. And Las Vegas is where Patty was taken to the home of Mickey and Jack Scott and kept in the Camelot apartments. I always like the overlapping of these names. Uh, James Earl Ray was in Portugal in the Dallas bar, and he went to Illinois and stayed with the Paines. Marina Oswald stayed with Ruth and Michael Payne, and he, when James Earl Ray left the Missouri Penitentiary, he stayed with the Paines in Illinois. And the Camelot uh, bo uh, Motel is the one where Patty stayed with the Scott, the parents of Mickey and Jack Scott. But it wasn't of any interest to Effie Bailey to find out how Patty happened to be staying in that town and who she would be staying with, because then again they'd find links to the Central Intelligence Agency. And Walter Scott was in military intelligence. He, he was the one who blew the whistle, not the FBI, uh, on the Patty Hearst case in Pennsylvania. And then later they said he was suicidal and was going to kill himself, and they put him in a mental hospital because he blew that story and uh, uh, broke the this, this story of where Patty was staying there, and he had been in military intelligence. Patty is uh, sounding pretty okay. She said uh, the only thing good that's happened to her, one of the good things that's happened to her so far is that she didn't marry Stephen Weed. And, of course, I wrote in 1974 that I believed or suggested that Stephen Weed was a part of this conspiracy. Unless we find out who wrote Black Abductor, in 1972 in San Diego, this non-existent press and the non-existent author that had the entire script, and I may run down some of that, the parallels between the kidnapping and the book Black Abductor for you. If we don't run that down, then we don't know the role that uh, Stephen Weed played because it did involve a teacher, and he came out from Princeton and went to a school, a private school where Patty was, and then when she was in college and went to Berkeley, he went over there, and they were together at the time of the kidnapping, and he literally opened the door and said, well, take anything you want. And out went Patty, and uh, she didn't see him after that. She didn't see Stephen Weed, and at the time of her trial, he didn't show up. He had a press conference to push and commercialize his own book and hasn't seen her since. And uh, this is a terrible tragedy how slimy these people are because no matter what she said about him, she was under captivity at the time. But we just slimed his way out like the Scots and the Harrises and abandoned Patty, and uh, she had no way of knowing that the government had set these creatures up, and I believe they did. Uh, Stephen Weed still has a future. We have to watch him and see where he goes from here. Uh, Patty said in this interview in the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, July 26, she said, Do you know the police had my name as a potential kidnap victim, and the FBI had my name, and they never told my family. They could have warned me, and I could have moved out of my apartment and moved home before it happened, and none of it would have happened. If they would have come to me and just told me my name was on a list, I would have been home in one minute. The FBI and Mr. Charlie Bates moved into my parents' home after I was kidnapped, and my parents asked them what would happen, and the FBI said, it's okay, we get this all the time. They've probably got her involved in a crime, but when she gets back, we'll put her straight in the hospital. My parents thought the FBI was trying to help them, and then when I was indicted, my parents threw them out of the house I still have very bad feelings about the FBI. Now, this is Patty Hearst in 1978, and, of course, I wrote that the FBI and the police knew all along, as soon as Joseph Romero and uh, Russell Little were arrested in Oakland, in the Oakland area in 1974, it was in January 74, for the shooting of Dr. Marcus Foster 
in the house was the name of Patricia Hurst and about a van and suggested kidnapping. And uh, the police went in there and saw all of that and didn't notify the family. And they saw the helmet, the post office helmet that William Harris had and the identification of all the members of the SLA that were to kidnap Patty. And they didn't contact them. They had three weeks to locate these people that were allegedly terrorists and prevent her kidnapping. I'll do more on the other side of this about Patty Hearst and the SLA. This is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. This is tape number 347, August the 18th, 1978, side two. There was uh, something revealing in the Bob Green interview that he had with Patty recently. And uh, this is also another reason I think her life is in danger, is that the amnesia that she had for a while, she couldn't remember anything after the Hibernia Bank, and she had a period of amnesia, which also is characteristic of uh, Charlie Bates saying, we'll put her into a hospital as soon as we arrest them and put her in a hospital, because that's where the amnesia takes place, and then she can forget to testify against the two people who kidnapped her, and then they're assured their release. If Patty is killed or if Patty acts mentally disturbed or if she has amnesia, then people are ready to believe that um, she can't account for her own kidnapping. There's this barrage of propaganda on radio station in San Francisco, KGO, where they talk all the time and uh, the moderators call talk and people call in and say, well, how would she know what happens? We don't believe her, or maybe she knew them, or uh, she's covering up a lot, and it's just Patty against the Harrises. And they never go in very much in depth on the fact that she was in a closet 54 days and tied by the wrist and uh, indoctrinated the first week solely by Donald DeFries, a prisoner. Um, and after Patty was kidnapped and after I wrote my article, then she went into the details when she came home and uh, about being kept in the closet and Donald DeFries talking to her for one week. Well, a girl like uh, Patty Hearst who's gone to private schools all of her life, who's been a sheltered, very wealthy white woman, you know, uh, isn't used to being with a black prisoner who's bragging about killing Dr. Marcus Foster or being with people with machine guns or living the life of an informer. He worked at the Los Angeles Police Department, and up till that time he had years of crime and bank robberies and attempted shoot uh, well there were shootings attempted murders and he was charged with a kidnapping down there uh it's very fearful for her and here he is wearing guns and uh, saying they'll blow her up for one week and then being read blood in my eye a book about george jackson and knowing that he also was killed in the prisons and uh, indoctrinated with a lot of guilt for being rich and a victim of their circumstances and being told that she's there uh, she's been rich and that society is uh, ripped off and that she feels she has to pay her dues for being Patty Hearst. And so she has a combined fear and guilt, plus the suggestion on one of the tapes. I have a, a tape of her first radio contact where she said, I'm all right, I have a cold, and they gave me a pill. Well, just the word pill could change her life forever. I know one acid in 1967, given by Carolyn Gilman to my son Marvin Goodwin, uh, has caused its 11 years of agony, sometimes bliss and clear heaven, sometimes sheer agony and regression. And these monsters have created these pills, so anything that you get for a cold can affect you the entire rest of your life. And I think Patty has to realize that, too. But she said in this article, I wouldn't work for a newspaper. She said they created uh, the image, and here's a newspaper heiress, of a person that isn't her at all, as Patty or Tanya. She said, I wouldn't work for a newspaper for anything. I don't blame the public for anything. 
the newspapers and the government are what I blame. Now, when she says she blames the government, then Patty Hearst, of course, is in danger. And the thing is that Randolph Hearst wants to appeal, and uh, the man that Patty's in love with and the committee, want to appeal to the kindness of Jimmy Carter for clemency. If the government was involved, I, even though I had worked for them, like Randolph Hearst has done and Catherine Hearst, for many years I would scream and yell and ask for a thorough investigation. If she knows that the government has played a part in uh, causing her this pain and killing these other six people in these costly trials and the burning of property and terrorizing neighborhoods and creating 22,000 extra FBI men and breaking into hippie communes and knocking down doors. There was a case of a girl that was supposed to be housing Patty Hearst back east, and uh, the FBI came in and broke down the place and terrorized her. And she got a settlement, I think it was around $15,000, for what happened, and last week the judge took it back and said, well, we changed our mind. You can't have it, and she's going to take it to the Supreme Court, and she's screaming back there, what right have they? It's like Nazi Germany, she said. So Patty Hearst is blaming uh, the newspapers, even though she's a newspaper heiress, for creating a personality that she isn't, and uh, also the government, and as I say, that's why Patty is in danger. Now, I have a copy here from the New York Times in September 30th, 1976. I wrote my article in 74, two years earlier. It came out in the fall of 74. The Harrises are indicted in the kidnapping of Miss Hurst. Now, can anyone tell me why the Harrises haven't been tried for kidnapping in two years? I really would like to know. And why their trial is going to come up at a time when Patty is in a prison nearby with two federal, two known federal agents, God knows how many there are in that prison besides Patty, but two known federal agents that could wipe her out, and it's four years since her kidnapping. I sent a letter to Reverend Dumkey to give to Patty Hurst, and I think that this week I'll send a copy of this letter to the Pleasant Prison too, Pleasant, California, because the way that I was able to keep Robert Hyde alive when he was scheduled for psychosurgery in Vacaville, the same prison where Donald DeFries was given the mind control job by CIA agent Colston Westbrook to be told he'd be a great leader. I called up the warden there, and many of you know the story, and said, don't you dare touch his brains, and that I would sue them, and that uh, uh, they were going to do this mind job surgically on Robert Hyde. And then when he was moved to Folsom, I called the warden there, and I called the warden down in Chino. I, have a habit of doing that because when I get there and threaten a lawsuit, a letter can be put into the wastebasket, but it's more effective. And you might try it if you have loved ones that you think are being ripped off, or if there's a prison situation where you think a person's life is in danger, uh, pick up the phone and call the warden. I've never read anywhere that anybody else has done that. And I know at Folsom, when I talked to the warden, he told several people there he thought I was on drugs or out of my mind to do such a thing. And then when Robert Hyde left Folsom and was sent back to Soledad and then later just released from the prison, um, the warden called him in and said, you really have a friend in May Brussel. And he said, I know it. And he, he said, uh, she went to bat for you and uh, spoke up. And I wasn't a relative of any kind, but I did go to bat. And Patty has to be very careful because the, the Harrises have asked Leonard Wineglass, as the attorney, and Emily William Harris have asked for Patty to have a psychiatric test before she testifies against them and to suggest that she is mentally sick after uh, going to school, keeping up her grades, keeping house, uh, leading a perfectly, in quotes, normal uh, childhood with no instance of mental disease or depression or symptom of any kind and then she's put in the trunk of a car in a garbage can and taken into a closet for 54 days and then trained to use a gun and then told to front for them and stand in front of a microphone and a camera and say, I'm Tanya, and identify herself and become a federal criminal within weeks after she's confined in a closet. Uh, they want her mind challenged to testify against them. If the SLA were a legitimate group and they needed money to continue uh, doing their Robin Hood operations of feeding the poor and taking from the rich and stealing from the Hibernia Bank, which was um, owned and run by Patty Hearst's best friend or grandfather, uh, owned, he just passed away several weeks ago, uh, she knew the family that had the bank and was familiar with them 
and so in she walks with her machine gun and uh, if they were legitimate they would secretly go and rob wherever they could to keep the thing going as long as they could i don't know people that ask the fbi to chase their ass by standing in front of a camera if they're so clever and they were all college graduates just about except donald DeFries, all of them were very educated uh, they just simply smashed the camera one of them wearing a mask or try to and uh, this way they said stand in front of the camera and tell them who you are not who they were and they turned into a federal criminal on top of being in a closet all this time and never have handled the we weapon before so uh, Patty becomes a criminal after being in this uh, condition of uh, guilt and fear and drugged and so forth and Nancy Ling Perry did work with the intelligence community and I spoke to a prisoner who knew the family in Oakland, and she had been in Washington uh, and had been in a drug program as uh, Emily William Harris worked with the DEA. These were the allegations. I say of Alex Bottos, uh, who was in Illinois and Indiana and did work there. So, Patty, uh, they want her to have her mind tested. And this is very important because they must know that she's going to be incoherent or crazy. So you have to, if they're going to use a defense of Patty's mind isn't right, and if Patty, in this last couple of weeks, has given interviews that show she's pretty much on top of things, of just who Charlie Bates and the FBI were, why she was picked because of her family, how the government uh, was involved, then the only choice that the Harrises have against a lifetime in prison, possibly, would be the incoherence of Patty to testify against them because she's the only one around, or uh, make her crazy so that she's not believable to the jury. Now, how do you protect her so that she doesn't appear crazy? One, these are the suggestions I gave to Reverend Dunphy to pass on to her, and which I also must pass immediately on to the prison. One, that she should take this advice and listen very carefully, that she should not leave any drink of water or Coke and walk away and come back. I don't know how the cells are open or how much traffic flow there is at Pleasant. It's supposed to be pretty loose, the loosest of the prisons, but that has its disadvantages. If she were in a place as tight as the women's equivalent, say, to Folsom or Soledad, and she just stayed in her own cell, she'd survive the trial if she had her own food in her own cell. But when it's loose, if she walks away and leaves something and comes back to it, the CIA has this tasteless substance that can be deposited in something that she drinks, and from that moment she can get silly and lose her mind or get destructive or get violent or suicidal and turn against herself and uh, become almost autistic and uh, not remember. Memories can be erased, and goodness knows the CIA has a list of goodies. Read Operation Mind Control if you want to read the choices of what they have to slip in. They also put into the prison, prisoners who are agents. Lewis Tackwood went to Soledad, working for the Los Angeles Police Department. He gets on a bus with other men that have been convicted and sentenced, and they say, what's your rap? Assault, what's your rap? Forgery. And uh, he can complain and bitch, and they use agent provocateurs who've already been in prison, so they know the lingo. And you accept them as underdogs, and uh, so that she can be in with other women, in addition to Squeaky Fromm and Sandra Good who are agent provocateurs, who can slip something to her if she leaves anything open. And she should only take from, say, a running tap and uh, not take anything that's open. If she drinks something, uh, leave what she doesn't want and never go back to it. And don't have a glass of water or coffee or tea at the table and get up and get some ketchup and come back to your table. Just forget it. Uh, eat what's on your plate. I do that when I travel and meet with people that I don't know or have appointments, people want to see me, and I don't meet them the first time at the house. Uh, we go down to a place like the Thunderbird here in town, a bookstore, a restaurant. But I don't get up and go to the ladies' room or look at a book or go back for anything at the counter and then come back. I, once I have something, I either eat it or drink it or leave it, and that's true inside the prison. Also, she shouldn't take any medication before the trial. If the doctors um, that she has are not CIA doctors. Dr. Jolly West was her psychiatrist. If they can trust the family doctor, Reverend Dumkey, I trust. Uh, if she has any sickness at all, if she cuts her finger, she shouldn't get uh, a shot. You know, if she has any toothache, uh, be careful. Don't get any fillings or anything taken care of until after the trial, until she's out. 
uh, CIA agents don't go to public dentists and doctors, and she in turn shouldn't go within the prison system. She should, she should be allowed the privilege of a her own doctor, a special doctor, in lieu of the fact that it can be proven that uh, people inside the prison are uh, given things to make them drowsy. I went to the trial of Hugo Pinnell out in Salinas, and he was charged with killing a prison guard, and he was in his cell, and the guard was outside the cell, and the guard died at Fort Ord Hospital, and Hugo was innocent of this crime that he's still serving time for. But he fell asleep at his trial. Can you imagine how boring it is to be charged with murdering a prison guard, and you're so incoherent and bumbling that you fall asleep? And Hugo kept saying that there was something in his food, and he was drowsy. And he got an easy conviction. He couldn't even put up a good defense. And the lawyer was put on the case just uh, the weekend before the trial. They switched lawyers. They wouldn't hold over for the lawyer that had done the work, but he was drowsy. Uh, Patty's working in the kitchen from 11 to 5, something like that, I believe, helping uh, stir food and cook food in the prison system. That's her work job. But I don't think that the breakfast or lunch that's brought to her she should have. I think that, that hers should bring in their own fruit and vegetable, and again, on the basis of poisoning people inside the prison. Because the prison system has a past record, and if uh, Randall Hearst doesn't believe me, I can introduce him to Lewis Tackwood and Robert Hyde, two people who are now outside, one who did this kind of thing on other people and one who was a victim, and uh, demand that this thing stop and that Patty can continuously be treated the way that uh, Robert Hyde and others. I'm just singling out two specifically that I became very close personal friends with, but there are many people who have corresponded with me, and I have records of their trials. Another thing is that she shouldn't take cigarettes from any person. She smokes cigarettes. I'm going into length with you on what the advice I gave Patty Hurst, because you can pass this on to other people you know in prison, or you can incorporate it into letters that you write to public officials. When somebody goes crazy, or a senseless murder, or uh, they go berserk for no reason, this PCP, this angel dust that causes uh, instant insanity for some people, or acid, certain types of acids, <clears throat> are injected into cigarettes. There are things other than just straight the tobacco in cigarettes, and a cigarette can be packed with this uh, kind of chemical. I've been reading a lot about that. So you don't take cigarettes from strangers. You get them from a vending machine, and again, if you don't keep the pack in your pocket the whole time, don't run out. If she's in the kitchen, she shouldn't ask somebody for a cigarette because she doesn't have a pack. Uh, you don't accept food or drink or cigarettes, anything that you put into your mind or body. And I wouldn't, she said she doesn't watch television. I wouldn't even watch that. There was a man that was wanted on a crime, and they flashed with permission of the federal government and federal communications on the screen, uh, go to the chief, go to the, the boss or the feds, hoping that he'd see the program and would get this subliminal suggestion of what to do. Well, what about all the other people that weren't... Uh, uh, supposed to see the message. Did they see it too? I mean, was everyone running in to turn themselves in or getting some kind of a message of behavior or direction? And so long as directions are given on screens. Uh, is this paranoid? I don't think so. I think in lieu of the fact that Patty is in a prison and has to testify against two hard-ass, cold, cruel prisoners that she didn't trust or like at any time, and she had no way of knowing their links uh, to the intelligence world or to the Scots, uh, no, I don't think it's cruel to uh, go into the possibility that she can be done in in order for the Harrises to get out. The only thing standing between Patty Hearst and uh, her life and her freedom for the time being is the way she handles uh, the case with the Harrises and stays alive and keeps her mind clear, and uh, it's very important to follow these rules, and as I say, I went at length with you because some people don't realize the danger, the precarious position that she's in, and uh, many of you know, of course, that the federal government is very capable of doing this to protect their own agents, and I believe the Harrises are agents of the federal government. The strongest link of the SLA to the CIA broke in 1975 and 76, and it has to do with a man named Michael Casey. And I'm going to go into this now and a part of next week's tape, too, because I don't have time for it on just one part of this tape, but I don't want to leave it off for you just dangling. So what we don't complete here, I will go into uh, with you next week. 
There was an article in the Los Angeles Times in 1975 about a man named uh, Michael Casey. And he had been at Soledad Prison, and he had worked uh, at Boys Town prior to that. He served two years in Soledad Prison, and I'm not sure exactly uh, if he wasn't an agent provocateur, similar to Louis Tackwood, who was up there also at one time, because uh, he worked with the intelligence community before, and he worked with the intelligence community afterwards, and then his charges were dropped against him, and uh, Michael Casey was there just prior to when Lewis, uh, to when Donald DeFries was put into Soledad. He had left by the time DeFries um, was there, but I'm not sure what, how much influence he had in Soledad. He had been in Southeast Asia uh, during the My Lai, uh, and he was a newspaper correspondent at the time, and then he came home and he was hired for boy at Boys Town, I guess that's the one in Omaha, Nebraska, where he became, in quote, the director for special projects, whatever that is, for Boys Town administration, and he worked there nine months, and he took with him uh, 31 confidential files of men from Boys Town, or in quotes, boys, which may be the groundwork of a nucleus uh, like Hitler's youth of men that they could use in and out of the prisons or on the streets as future agents. He took these files with him, and he was convicted for forgery and put inside Soledad, and then later he was released. And in March 14, 1975, Michael Casey um, shows up and uh, says to Randolph Hearst, he gets Randolph Hearst's phone number in New York City, and he said he had information about Patty Hearst that she was in Southeast Asia. Now, he used the Southeast Asia hoax... Uh, as a way to get money to uh, go over to Hong Kong. I'm sure he had money anyway. The Los Angeles Times sent him over there. And he went under the conduit. He had been working for Time magazine, another strong conduit of the Central Intelligence Agency. And uh, his excuse was to find Patty. Now, they were looking for Patty in 1975. And this was a wonderful way to spread what I wrote in 1974 to make the SLA international to reach out overseas and link it maybe with the Bader Monhoff or the Japanese Red Army or the PLO. If Patty were over on another continent uh, disguised, then the um, Interpol would get into it, the international police with their great data banks, and it would be bigger than the FBI and the CIA, and then would get into the Interpol. So Michael Casey had contacted the Hearst people and seemed to have information about Patty that nobody else would have, which is logical uh, if you were in the intelligence community. So he goes to Southeast Asia, and this is in 1975, and with him he had the credits for Time magazine. Now, the Henry Luce connections to the political assassinations, the FBI, the counterintelligence program, uh, are a whole cassette I can do for you by itself. But he carried these credentials of the loose organization of Time Magazine. Whitaker Chambers worked for Time Magazine. Robert Kaiser, who was with um, Sirhan Sirhan when even the FBI and nobody else could be with him, uh, worked for I mean, knew Claire Luce and worked for Time Magazine. He wrote RFK Must Die, a brainwash uh, cover job on Sirhan Sirhan. Uh, Michael Casey had credentials of Time Magazine and went over to Southeast Asia on the fluke that he was going to find Patty Hearst. But he didn't find Patty Hearst. He came home, and uh, there was a long article in the Los Angeles Times, and he came home and he worked with the Vietnamese that were brought to this country. He took uh, a woman, Mrs. Trout, uh, a Los Angeles Times reporter who worked with the Hearst team, uh, down to uh, Casey, took them to Camp Pendleton to see the Vietnamese refugees that were high in the Phoenix program. And I compared um, the SLA to the Phoenix program coming home to the United States, and that Phoenix agents such as Colston Westbrook, who worked with the CIA in Southeast Asia and Tokyo in mind control, had set up the SLA, the nucleus of the SLA. So Michael Casey was down with the Vietnamese Phoenix operators down in Camp Pendleton with a time uh, magazine credentials with Randolph Hearst's phone number, and he took a woman from the Hearst organization down there, and uh, they had the proper credentials and clearance to visit the Vietnamese premier, uh, Key, former South Vietnamese the premier, and Casey's credibilities were good. He'd been in Boys Town, uh, he worked for a time, he'd gone to Southeast Asia, he knew Premier Key, uh, he'd been in Vietnam before, and he took this trip 
allegedly to Hong Kong in 1975 to find Patricia Hearst. But what he came home with was something much greater than uh, just Patty Hearst, who wasn't there at all, and the Pentagon knew it. He got something like $15,000 for the trip and salary and telephone calls and expenses and um, credentials. And he said he worked for NBC in Vietnam at one time. NBC denied that, but of course John Mitchell and Richard Nixon denied that they knew anything about Watergate, uh, and so did E. Howard Hunt. So uh, they're trained, the CIA, for denial, so that's not important. And Michael Casey also said that in the United States, Senator John Tunney uh, had intervened with Governor Ronald Reagan to get his parole from prison. And of course Ronald Reagan denied that, but uh, Michael Casey, a short time, was in Soledad, but sandwiched in between that, as I say, we're at Boys Town, which has been identified with intelligence operations. He had important files from Boys Town. He was with the My Lai Massacre group, and then he was back in Hong Kong and Camp Pendleton with Premier Key. He had the time credentials and said he worked with NBC. So Michael Casey isn't any great slouch, and he contacts Randolph Hearst, I'm going to Asia to find Patty. Well, he didn't find Patty, but one of the biggest stories in the country uh, broke shortly afterwards, and it was suppressed by the New York Times. The biggest story came in the Washington Post, and I'll give you the date, September the 16th, 1976. That was just uh, two years ago. This is the anniversary of this story. And uh, there was one little article in uh, came over the UPI for general uh, newspapers, that this is the way the first small article on the UPI came. It said the Justice Department is investigating the loss of a top secret notebook belonging to Leo Chern, chairman of the President's Foreign Advisory Board. Leo Chern was a member of uh, President Ford's Intelligence Oversight Committee. He had gone with Commander Lionel Olmar, O L M E R, a Navy career man of 19 years to Europe. Leo Chern had gone and he had been head of the International Rescue Committee, which was instrumental in bringing uh, Lee and Marina Oswald to this country. It's a violently anti-communist uh, CIA front, and he was on the intelligence board. And in 1975, Leo Chern took a trip to Europe with one of the head Navy people and came home. And when they got home, they found out that the list of all their top agents in the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, that their working list of agents was, in quotes, lost in Europe. The first story was that he lost it at some whorehouse, which he vehemently denied. But Leo Chern went to Europe in 1975 and with a top 19-year-old man of Navy intelligence representing Gerald Ford and his intelligence board. In 75, he goes to Europe and comes home and doesn't have his book. But Michael Casey, with the background I gave you, went to Southeast Asia at the same time that Chern was in Paris, and Michael Casey comes home with the book of the list of the intelligence agencies of the CIA, and then barters with Judge Carter and gets involved in the Patty Hearst case with the known list of agents that Michael Chern had. So two men take a trip in 1975 to Southeast Asia and Europe, both working at different parts of the world, but when he comes home in 1975, uh, it surfaces in 76 that Casey is bartering and involved in the Patty Hearst case, and in his hands are the books that belong to Leo Chern and Mr. Olmar of the Navy. Now, this is pretty scandalous, and it's complicated because of the intelligence community links and how it affected Patty Hearst and then Judge Carter, and then Judge Carter died, and um, Judge Oreck took on the case and prosecuted Patty in that miserable trial. I uh, will read to you parts of the September 16, 1976, Washington Post story, Intelligence Advisor and the Green Book Affair. In, in, as I say, in February of 1976, uh, just months prior, Gerald Ford had put Leo Chern on the Oversight Committee to watch the illegal actions of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA, and of course I had accused the SLA operation of being a defense intelligence combined Tom Charles Houston operation with all the intelligence operations. Leo Chern was head of the International Rescue Committee, the CIA front, long associated with CIA money. 
He was appointed by uh, Gerald Ford and then later had direct links to Patty Hearst Randolph Hearst after he lost his Green Book in Paris with the names of over 100 CIA intelligence agents. Now this is important because with the names of Colston Westbrook, Willie Wolfe, Emily and William Harris, and people, Angela Atwood, Gary Atwood is still alive in Indiana. Angela is dead. He didn't even go to her funeral. The, four, the two of them were supposed to be agents together. He brought her to California and went back to Indiana. And when she was burned, uh, he wasn't even interested in that uh, cremated body that the Los Angeles Police Department burned. He could care less. Now, these people had all been to Europe. These agents, uh, in fact, at the house, when the house burned down in Los Angeles, there was a passport book of William Harris. It doesn't say what countries he was in in his army papers. And it doesn't say why uh, the, a member of the SLA would be carrying army papers with them or why they were in that house at the shootout or where he was stationed in Vietnam or did he in fact know any of the people in Vietnam that Michael Casey was visiting later at Camp Pendleton or the uh, Colson Westbrook knew in Vietnam. But a list of 100 intelligence agents were in this book and the book was in the hands of Michael Casey when he came home from Southeast Asia. I'll continue with this next week because unfortunately we're out of it. You'll have to pick it up on the next tape next week. This is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California.